Hello and welcome to this webinar, uh, 39 from 39. 39 minutes about invisible development. Uh, some of the issues that we are facing today in real property uh, when it comes to developing land. And the title we've given to this webinar uh, comes from the fact that a lot of the topics we're talking about today, so implied terms in agreements, um, easements, uh, terms in overage agreements, uh, they're not physical. We can't see them. Uh, they might be incorporable elements. We can't look at the document. But they certainly impact on how we develop and use land and how we advise our clients what they can and they cannot do uh, with buildings and with development and with the rights over their own property. So uh, I'm David Sortel. I'm a barrister of 39 Essex Chambers. I uh, specialise in uh, real property and in construction. And I'm joined by Ashley Pratt, who also practices extensively in real property, and by Dan Kozelko, who has worked extensively in real property and was actually a judicial assistant in the Supreme Court, uh, working on some extremely important issues that we face as practitioners today. So with uh, turning to that in mind, uh, let's uh, begin uh, the webinar. So I'm going to be uh, speaking uh, first uh, about um, uh, the case, a uh, recent case of U Design Services against Illibrill T uh, PT Limited, and whether or not you could have an implied term uh, to market a development. Uh, Ashley is going to speak after me on Bockenfield Aerodrome against Claire Hugh as to whether or not uh, you can have an easement in the sky. And then finally, Dan is going to speak about the case of Fishbourne Developments Limited against Stevens. Uh, about the interpretation of the word uh, development in an option agreement. So let's begin uh, looking, uh, turning far away to Singapore. Uh, this isn't a picture of, of development in question. Uh, this is in fact a picture of our Singapore offices. But you design services against uh, Illib Realty is all about the development of a large scale, high value residential property development uh, in Singapore. And it was an interesting uh, scheme that uh, you designs and, uh, and markets um, uh, residential developments uh, across the world. And, um, excuse me one moment. Uh, so I understand not um, sharing my screen. There we are. So you develops a large scale high value residential property developments uh, in uh, Singapore, and uh, it is effectively a designer, and it produces its brand, and the U branded interior design is extremely valuable. Um, Iliv is a property developer, they're in charge of actually building uh, these developments, uh, this particular development in Singapore, and then uh, potentially going on to market and sell them, and, and they entered into a design uh, service agreement you agreed to grant a sub-license to use its designs and provide other services, whereas Illiv came under an express obligation to actually build the project, and that's with all due diligence and expedition. Now, Illiv undertook to provide sales, site progress reports, and when the last department uh, was sold, to pay an incentive fee to you. And it was quite an extensive uh, agreement. So, it was entered into, um, and completion was originally estimated for late 2010. In fact, uh, completion was only achieved in late 2013. In the meantime, there had been a significant fall in the Singaporean property market. So Illiv did try to sell the apartments at values which are below those of, that they'd originally anticipated, but unfortunately, uh, no sales were achieved. So the properties were therefore rented out, which meant that you were not going to be entitled to its final tranche of payments uh, because no sales or the sales had not been achieved. Uh, they brought a claim uh, against Illiv. And their argument was that there was an implied obligation in the DSA, the Design Service Agreement, to complete the sale of the apartments within a reasonable time of the third quarter of 2008 or the completion of a development of the apartments. So the Court of Appeal had to wrestle with the implication of terms 
uh, into agreements uh, for uh, real property. And of course, uh, you are always going to face an uphill battle. Uh, all familiar with the leading case now of Mark Spence is going to be NP Barry Bass, uh, where, as you recall, uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, was not convinced uh, that they could imply a term in that case. And uh, I've also taken a quote from Ali and Petroleum Company of Trinidad and Tobago, as Privy Council case, where Lord Hughes emphasised that when we're looking at the implication of terms, in case of uh, to give it business efficacy or a reasonable bystander saying, well, of course you'd have that term, the concept of necessity uh, must not be watered down. And he said the term is to be implied only if it's necessary to make the contract work. It might be so obvious it goes without saying and the parties didn't put their minds to a point or would have rounded on the notion or officious bystander to say, and with one voice, of course, or it's necessary to give a contract business efficacy. And usually the approach will be the same, whichever test uh, you go down. So Lord Justice Carr uh, made it clear that uh, if you don't uh, fix a time for an obligation, the usual obligation, it will be completed within a reasonable period of time. Now, this claim failed at first instance, and it also failed in the Court of Appeal. The problem that you faced is that the agreement already had a practical and commercial coherence. Uh, both parties, both you and Illiv, were taking a risk of late or indeed uh, no sales. And Lord Justice Carr said the parties chose to take on the commercial risks in the way they did, in my judgment, the answer to any concern about the prospects of you never receiving the balance of the retainer fee. And overall, you had entrusted the sale process to Illiv. But part of the reason why uh, the Court of Appeal rejected the appeal was even if there is a gap, then how is it to be filled? So they examined the counterfactual of these parties negotiating, uh, discussing, well, if these apartments aren't sold, if they're sitting there basically on, on, on the shelf and no one is purchasing them, uh, is it effectively going to be liable in damages for it? And you can see if they had turned that notional bystander, uh, would he or she have said, of course? No, they certainly wouldn't. But why would it have take on the obligation to sell and effectively, if you can't sell in a certain time, to pay you money? And even if you could say, well, you have to sell within a reasonable period of time, what do we actually mean by a reasonable time uh, within the uh, notion of design services agreement? This appears to be one of those cases uh, where it's simply, if a party didn't make provision for it, uh, then the loss basically uh, lies where it falls. Essentially, what was uh, decided in PNP Barry Bass. But, but we know there are other cases uh, where the courts have been willing to imply uh, such a term. And the one which was referred to by the Court of Appeal uh, was the decision of Sparks and Biden. Now, this uh, was about property development in Wimbledon. Where when you read the case, uh, you can see it's a slightly different kettle of fish. Uh, essentially, the owner of, of the land, Mr. Sparks, was approaching retirement. He was in his uh, late 60s, and he wanted to develop the land uh, himself or, or through someone else to fund his retirement. So what he did was he granted an option uh, to a developer uh, together with overage, and the overage uh, arose only when the dwellings were sold. The developer was under contractual obligation to obtain planning permission and to construct the dwellings, but there was no express term of a developer that he had to sell them. Instead, as they were built, he leased them out, uh, thereby evading uh, the need to uh, pay overage. And uh, Judge Davis White, QC, sitting as a judge of the Chancery Division, held there was an implied term, but as for new houses we sold, and this was to be within a reasonable period of time. The whole structure of the contract was directed towards a situation uh, whereby overage was payable. Otherwise, uh, why, build, why build the thing and then have an overage agreement if the developer didn't come under that obligation? So what was said in the Court of Appeal in you was essentially uh, this is a bit more like a uh, joint venture. 
Um, it was a dispute uh, between two individuals. Vendor needed to obtain proceeds, and there was no disparity in contributions of interest of the two parties. So, turning back to um, to, to Sparks, this was essentially a series of steps, express time limit. So, quite different to the balance of risk that you see in you. Now, what wasn't referred to in the Court of Appeal uh, was a case uh, about 10 years ago, Renewal Leeds Limited against Lowry Properties. Again, is an overage case, contained an overage agreement that was triggered by the completion of the final sale of a completed residential unit. So developer got permission uh, to, to get uh, 84 houses, but they never quite finished and they never uh, sold the last four. And in fact, they had been marketing those remaining stock for much more than the previous uh, 80. So what the, uh, what the uh, claimant argued was, was a, a term, an applied term, to market and sell the houses on the development as soon as reasonably practical and at the best price reasonably obtainable. Now that case uh, was pre-BNP Paribas and uh, the judge, uh, David Allen QC, sitting as a deputy judge of a high court, referred back to the previous, or well, being the previous leading case, Attorney General Belize against Belize Telecom Limited. So, here again, an overage case with steps uh, leading to the payment of overage, quite different to you. But whether, whether this case, the Unilever case, is important is because we now have two lines of case law. The one applying the far stricter test um, in uh, BNP Paribas, where you don't apply the term you have to sell. Um, with a uh, development agreement, but we also have two overage cases, and normally overage is seen is interpreted rather strictly, um, where, um, where such a term was implied. I have to say, in my experience, it's not unusual to find problems uh, where one party simply doesn't want to take the last step to pay overage. That's quite common in overage and in option agreements. So the best tip, of course, is to draft it expressly. But failing that, uh, I think we now have to look at the individual facts of each case and to uh, go back to the court, the court of appeal has said and to see which side of the line our particular case uh, lies on. So all of these are difficult areas. Uh, thank you very much. Just like to remind you, uh, we have a Q&A box. So if you have any questions about this case uh, or the following cases, then please do drop uh, a message and we're going to come back to it in the last nine minutes. So I'll now hand over to Ashley. Thank you, uh, David. Hopefully that is now uh, sharing uh, with everybody. Um, Bear with me one moment. I think that should be it now. I, I'm going to be, hello everybody. I'm going to be dealing with uh, the case of um, Bockenfield, Aerodrome and Claire Hugh. Uh, hopefully I'll be able, to, be able to answer those questions posed on the first slide, namely, can you have an easement in the sky? If so, what are the rights of a landowner uh, in relation to the airspace above their land and of aircraft to pass through that airspace? You should be able to see uh, on the left-hand side of the slide that there is a plan. That is not for decoration. Uh, it is a plan from the case uh, itself. And you should be able to make out on the plan uh, the runways and just to the left of the rest, west of the runway is Claire Hughes or the defendant's uh, land, which I'll come to shortly. Uh, the facts of this case, um, as I will explain, understandably uh, brought about a uh, hotly contested uh, piece of litigation. The claimants had the benefit of a grant, the terms of which I'll come to shortly, 
uh, to use airspace following a 1993 conveyance. The land adjacent to the airfield, uh, the defendant's land, was granted planning permission in 2001 to turn the woodland into a burial ground. I should pause there to say uh, within that burial ground on the plan I just showed uh, on the previous slide, uh, there were remains of uh, 10 deceased children as well as uh, numerous remains of adults. Um, following the grant of the planning permission, uh, 16,000 trees were planted and approximately 12,000 of which remained at the time of the case. Um, by way of background, some of the trees closest to the runway measured 23.5 feet to 33 feet in height, and one can probably imagine where this case is going. Bockham Field uh, Aerodrome bought a claim alleging that the height of the trees was making it unsafe for pilots to take off and land, and broadly speaking, the claims in respect of the height of the trees uh, amounted to firstly uh, an actionable interference, and two, they said that it was a derogation of grants, and I'll come to those in a moment. But further, it was argued that certain trees needed to be removed completely. Given what was buried in the adjacent land, as I've just mentioned, it's understandable why the defendants uh, were less than keen to agree to the removal of the trees. It was said that certain trees needed to be removed as they caused turbulence when the pilots were landing and taking off, and the claimants framed this part of the action as a der derogation of grant. So, what did the 1993 grant allow the claimants to do? Uh, it said uh, the unrestricted right to use at a safe height the airspace above the retained land for the passage of aircraft in circuit, uh, that means coming in and out, and arriving or leaving the property. Uh, some of the important words, certainly it seems to me within that uh, grant, were unrestricted height, safe height, and above the retained land. Uh, it was quite clear in my view, uh, at least, that, that the grant did in fact provide in terms for a right to the safe entry and exit of the uh, airspace. One tends to start the exercise of interpreting the terms of an easement using the well-known checklist. Uh, I've taken the checklist from uh, Gale and Easements, it's in various uh, 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 books. I won't read all of these out, uh, but I think the first thing to say about the terms of this easement was that it was pretty clear as you what, what the uh, airfield could and couldn't do. Um, what I do want to uh, deal with though is um, the interpretation of uh, the second part of the uh, easement slide that I've put up there, the C, D and E factors. Um, C, the overall purpose of the relevant provisions. Uh, this heading was discussed in the case as whether the safety meant uh, safety just for the pilots or safety for those on the ground over the defendants. It seemed to me to have been uncontroversial that the easement would have to protect the safety of those on the ground, uh, on the claimants and defendants land, as well as the safety of the pilots. After all, of course, the purpose of the grant was to allow the pilots to fly in and out. Uh, factor D, the facts and the circumstances known or assumed by the parties at the time the document was executed, it was known that the airfield was going to be used for planes taking off and landing. landing. It must be remembered that it was not known at the time of executing the easement that the retained land uh, or the defendant's land would have uh, trees grown on it, of course, for woodland burial. And finally, E, commercial common sense, I'll leave this heading for now as I deal with this uh, part later. Uh, Riley versus Booth was uh, relied upon by the defendants. In Riley, it was said that an easement could not have been intended to prevent the use of the retained land by the Serbian toner for general ag agricultural purposes, which may include, for example, animal farm machinery and such other material that one might expect to find on such agricultural land. The thrust of the defendants' submissions uh, was that the growing the trees was well within the ordinary use of such land and their land could not be limited by the terms of such an easement, as no easement can validly obstruct the defendant's reasonable use of their own land. So far, so good. If the defendants were correct that the easement was invalid, the question then arises, of course, as to what rights exist freestanding of an easement to use airspace. Part of that was uh, discussed in uh, Bernstein um, uh, Skyviews uh, and General uh, Limited. Um, and uh, Within that case, of course, the owner uh, of land had their right restricted in respect of air, uh, airspace 
above his land to such height as is necessary for the ordinary use and enjoyment of his land and the structures upon it. Uh, and above that height, he has no greater rights in the airspace uh, than any other member of the public. The defendant's answer to that was this doesn't matter because the trees were grown in the ordinary use and, uh, use and enjoyment. The claimant's case was that the granting of the easement resolved the point raised in Bernstein and growing the trees to such a height did not amount to the reasonable use um, of, uh, of this. Um, for completeness, and although guidance has moved on since the time of the grant, um, it was referred section 76 of the Civil Aviation Act was uh, referred to, 1982 Act, where it said no cause of action shall lie in respect of a trespass or in respect of the nuisance by reason only of the flight of an aircraft over any property. Uh, and then it goes on to deal with the conditions and it's effectively whether or not it's reasonable to uh, fly over the property. I'm not sure in of itself that it takes much as much further, but to say that subject to air control and license, licensing, etc., that generally speaking, an owner of land is prevented from taking any action so long as the flight path complied with the act. Provisionally, therefore, you would not need an easement to fly above land at a reasonable height. However, in this case, of course, there was an easement and that had to be considered as against the right that the owner, owners of the defendant's land had to their reasonable use and enjoyment of the land. The claimant's case uh, was that failing to reduce the height of the trees amounted to an actionable interference. They rely, relied on the case of Zielinski, uh, which said that, I'll just briefly summarize that, not every interference with the right of way is actionable. The question of whether the owner reasonably requires to exercise his right in a particular way is to be addressed by uh, reference to convenience. And if an obstruction interferes with a particular mode of exercise of the right, which uh, is neither unreasonable nor perverse, of the owner to insist upon, then the obstruction would be actionable. Now, pausing there, I have to say, when I read the facts of this case, uh, my initial instinct, uh, at least, was why doesn't the owner of the defendant simply reduce the size of the trees, as this would maintain the burial plots and allow the easement to continue as it was intended? I did think uh, that that might be too simple a solution. solution. However, uh, Judge Kramer found, having considered the test, that there was an actual interference. Um, I'll come to the remedy shortly, but uh, actually uh, the very simple conclusion of this case was cut the trees down, it doesn't affect the burials, it doesn't affect the, uh, the children that are buried there and allows the pilots to come and go um, sensibly from the, from the site. As a second part of the action, um, the court considered uh, derogation of grants. Uh, I won't read out the Carter and Cole uh, factors when considered, considering derogation of grant. I have, however, set out the test for you, as you can see there in the slide. The court focused on derogation of grant from two perspectives. Uh, firstly, in respect to reducing the height of the trees, and secondly, in respect to whether some of the trees needed to be removed altogether. The judge said that he did not need to necessarily address the issues of reducing the height of the trees under this head, as I've just set out, there was already found to be an actionable interference, but did accept that failing to cut the trees uh, to an appropriate height did also amount to a derogation. Interestingly, and perhaps uh, for people that specialise in this particular area, uh, and more broadly, in fact, whilst the judge found against the claimants in respect to removing some of the trees altogether, as there was not the necessary evidence to justify the amount of turbulence being claimed to amount to a derogation. The judge did, however, leave open uh, the case that trees causing turbulence could amount to a derogation of uh, grants. That is, of course, going to come down to the particular evidence. In this case, it's quite clear that wasn't the strongest part of the case, but one can imagine a case where turbulence affected by trees may well uh, fall foul of um, both derogation and actionable interference actions. Finally, um, as I've said, the trees were found to have been uh, an actionable interference. The judge came to the conclusion that any trees that affected uh, the pilot being able to enter the airfield at 20 feet should be reduced in height. So you'll recall from the introduction, it was 23 and a half to 33 feet. And what the judge said was, bring them all down to 20 feet for safety measures. As such, the court ordered mandatory injunction in respect to the same. So this, um, to end where I began, to answer the initial question, can you have an easement in the sky? The answer appears to be yes, you can. Uh, but as ever, each of these cases will turn on their facts. Um, thank you for listening. And I'm going to pass you over now to uh, Dan.
Thank you, Ashley, and um, hello, everyone. What I'm going to speak about today is a recent Court of Appeal judgment that came down in, um, which came down in December 2020, um, called Fishburn Development and Stevens, and hopefully everyone can um, see that slideshow. So this case essentially turned on the question of what the word development meant in an option agreement. So as we can see here, um, the basic facts were the land was initially owned by Mr. Bailey, then Mrs. Bailey, and then Mrs. Stevens. I'm gonna talk about the owner has always been Mrs. Stevens. And Mr. Saunders was the developer, although different companies over time actually held the options. And what the option was, was for the sale of the land that I showed you in that photo on the previous slide. And there would be a sale of that land at 70% of its value if planning permission were obtained for that land. And th this reflects a very standard kind of option agreement, it seems to me, where a developer comes along, tries to get planning permission for development, and if so, buys land at a discount. And in that scenario, everyone wins. Now, the options here started off in the 1990s in quite an um, informal way. And they, they took the form of short letters, um, which really didn't set out much in the way of the actual um, agreement. Now, the actual option at the centre of this case was one granted in 2002, and there was a supplemental agreement in 2014. Now, the Court of Appeal and the High Court both looked at all the terms of this option, as one would expect, and I've not copied all of them out here, but there are four that particularly matter, which I've included here. So there's the definition of the option, and the definition of planning application here, and you'll see here the use of the term planning permission. And then clause 1.9, which is the crucial one. Planning permission means a planning permission granted by the local planning authority permitting any development of the property. And what people may see there is a lot of the language that we expect to see in planning law. So there's a reference to the local planning authority and there's a reference to the word development. And it's the interpretation of that particular word that really mattered here. And then clause 3.5 said that the um, option became operational when the purchaser, that was Mr. Saunders in this case, obtained planning permission. Now, the history of this land was that multiple attempts were made to get planning permission and none were successful. So instead, in 2016, a planning permission simply to erect a new pitched roof on one of the agricultural buildings was obtained. And what Mr. Saunders said of that was, well, I now have planning permission for development on the land, and therefore I'm entitled to use the option. And that is the core matter that the High Court and the Court of Appeal had to consider. What Mr. Saunders say was, yes, that is sufficient to engage the option, because building a new pitched roof is development within the parameters of Section 55 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, and Mrs. Stevens said, no, 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 a planning permission would need to be um, about development of the whole or a substantial part of the land for building. And that was the two options the High Court and the Court of Appeal decided between. In actuality, when this case was heard, there was a second case advanced by Mrs. Stevens, which was if her primary case failed, that Mr. Saunders would only be entitled to buy a portion of the land to which the planning permission related, but neither the High Court nor the Court of Appeal really got to considering that. Now, I've um, provided the um, case law on the interpretation of contracts. It's all very well known, and I don't really propose to say much about it. Um, one of the things that was discussed was whether um, Arnold and Britain and Wood and Capita rode back on the earlier case law. What the Court of Appeals said was Lord Hodge deals with this in um, Wood and Arnold didn't row back on Rainy Sky. It may be that Chartbrook and the earlier case law um, didn't start 
um, as closely with the actual wording of the contract. But what really um, matters here is the case law post uh, from Rainy Sky and onwards. Now, before we turn to actually what was decided, let's just briefly look at Section 55 of the Town and Country Planning Act. And there is also um, subsection 1A. And one of the things that um, everyone will be aware of is that this particular provision is very broad and it's about um, catching um, operations that will be described as development to then require planning permission for that work to be undertaken. Now, what the judge at first instance and the Court of Appeal hen held was that Mrs. Stevens was correct. And in fact, development here did not mean simply development within Section 55 of the Town and Country Planning Act. Now, on point one, they consider the word development. Um, Asplin dealt with this quite shortly in one paragraph. And what she said was that taking the overall facts of the case, looking at the land, looking at the nature of the farm and what was proposed, the word development did not simply mean the technical meaning, which was in section 55 of the Act. And it seems to me this is a really important point. One cannot simply rely on an interpretation to be adopted um, from a statute. If you're going to refer to a statute definition, it seems to me you, when you're drafting these kinds of contracts, you should try and be as explicit as possible to make clear what definition you're referring to. In this case, Mr. Saunders had said um, that development would mean Section 55 development, but it never appeared in any of the options that this was the case. And Mrs. Just, uh, Lady Justice Asplin was convinced by the fact that that was a very technical meaning, and, and she used the word technical in her judgment. So that's the first point to take away here. If you're going to use a statutory definition, make that explicit in the contract. Don't rely on an interpretation um, of simply the word. Refer to the statute. Now, Point two was that there was actually a Court of Appeal judgment from the early 2000s, which dealt with this issue. Now, this, this was a similar case where there was a large portion of land. It was in the region of 40 acres um, and planning permission was obtained for development of 2.5 of the acres. And in this Court of Appeal case, Hallam Land, it was argued that that would allow them to engage um, the option to purchase all of the land. Very similar facts. What the Court of Appeal said here as well was that no, development would not be interpreted to mean the broad meaning in Section 55 of the Town and Country Planning Act. And what Ricks, Mr. Law Justice Rick said in this case, uh, which was particularly interesting, was the purchaser paid only £5,000 for this option. He buys a mere spares for a small price. The agreement does not have to go out of its way to ensure him success. And that was... Um, a, a case with very similar facts and very similar wording. Now, what the Court of Appeal actually did here was not rely on Hallam Land. And what it instead said is it would decide the case on its own interpretation, looking at the contract on its own terms. And it's worth bearing this in mind when you're drafting contracts, options, leases, etc. is if you're going to use a cribbed term, you need to be very careful to make sure that you're using it properly and specifically, so here Asplin said, and this is the quote from the Court of Appeal. And what she essentially said is, yes, while the facts are quite similar and the wording is quite similar, you couldn't transplant the reasoning directly and, and instead the Court of Appeal decided this case on its own terms um, and on the terms particularly of the option in this case. So take care when cribbing terms from previous judgments. Now point three, and this is particularly relevant for this kind of option, um, what Mr Saunders said was, well, there is no reason to think that um, Mrs Stevens' interpretation is correct. You, she isn't entitled to get this massive increase in value if what the contract says is I get my 30% discount if I give any development. And in making this point, uh, Mr. Saunders Campbell pointed to Arnold, the Supreme Court case, where there was quite an unfortunate case where a strict reading of the contract read to the application of compound interest to um, 
the part one of the parties in that case, um, which made the actual agreement that had been agreed really commercially disadvantageous. And what Mr. Stevens said was it's the same situation here. We shouldn't try and force a more commercially sensible reading when the terms of this option are quite clear on their face. Now, um, that was rejected at first instance and in the Court of Appeal. What Lady Justice Asplin said was that it made little sense on Mr. Saunders' case because he would get a 30% discount in circumstances where he secured no increase in value. Mrs. Stevens could have gone out into the world and sold her land at 100% of the value. It only makes real commercial sense if one has in mind the considerable increase in value that would have come with a proper planning permission. And so that argument based on Arnold was rejected. And that makes sense when one considers that Lady Justice Asplin had already by this stage rejected that the meaning of development was clear. In um, Arnold, the point was, well, on its face, the contract was in fact clear. And now the final point here um, in this judgment and to bear in mind is looking at the earlier option agreements. So the 2002 option in its recital said this clarified the earlier agreements. Now what Saunders said was no, no, no. What this was was a new and comprehensive option agreement. And therefore the judgment in HIH casualty and general insurance would apply. And you should not have regard to the earlier um, option agreements in interpreting this one. Now, Lady Justice Aspen rejected this also. Um, she said that HIH casualty doesn't set out a strict rule of law. You can't be dogmatic about when you will go back and look at the earlier contracts that have been agreed. And in fact, based on the um, recital in this case, and it, it seems relatively clear to me, the recital said it was clarifying. It wasn't a new agreement. And in HIH, it really made clear that it was a new agreement. So this it seemed an entirely usual and understandable interpretation of the 2002 option and its recitals. So those were four main points to take away. There were some other points in the judgment of the Court of Appeal in this case that I've set out here. It's worth a read, it's not particularly long. Um, it's a useful judgment for understanding how to interpret this kind of agreement and how to draft more generally. And it's worth pointing out as an epilogue to this case, they've continued to try and get uh, planning permission for this land. This is the current block plan for the land. Um, it was rejected in early 2020 and an application has been put in again. So the land, the, the story for this land is not done yet. And that's the end of my presentation on this particular case. Um, I'm going to ask um, David and Ashley to come back on now and if we've got any questions and we'd be very happy to um, answer them. Well, I'm looking at that question and answer box and it seems, Dan, Ashley, that uh, you have answered everyone's questions <laughs> except for mine, Dan. <laughs> oh, right. Um, see, I've given, I've spoken about uh, the UK case and it was clear I found a line of cases uh, which might not seem to stand on all fours the outcome. And Dan, you've gone through the Fishbourne case and we can see the Court of Appeal makes it clear uh, we need to go back to principles such as in um, Captain Wood about interpretation of contracts. And even if you have a similar agreement, a similar uh, situation, we can't simply just transpose that onto the facts yeah. of, of a new case. So when, as council, we are advising uh, on an overage, an option agreement, a development agreement, how much can we just simply say, yeah, if we look at this case, it's very similar. And how much do you think we need to go back and actually look at the basic tenets of interpretation such as the House of Lords and the Supreme Court has developed them? Yeah, I, I, I think what this case is, is a um, cautionary tale for me, I think, which is you can look at other judgments and see how words have been used and rely on that to a certain extent, but you've always got to be aware of the, the, the background of the case and the background of the facts in your situation. I actually think Fishbourne was a bit of a um, special case. It seems to me relatively obvious what this contract was really intending to do. And that's the commercial sense point, the third point that I discussed. Um, I think when we're advising, there's, there's no harm in going back and looking at the underlying principles. I think, I think that's a valuable thing to do. But I, my interpretation of Fishburne is that um, while it's a cautionary tale, it doesn't mean that you can't still rely on judgments and sort of crib terms to use, you know, the 
terminology that I described earlier. I don't know if you'd agree with that, David. I think yeah, I think that's that's right. And I mean, Ashley, you, when you're in your talk uh, in respect of um, that particular easement, I think one of the points you went back to was and it goes back to the basic tenets of how to interpret uh, yeah. an easement uh, rather rather than just typing in aircraft easement cases <laughs> into law tail or west law. No, ab absolutely. I think um, the point that Dan just raised is a good one, and I think it flows over into easements as well, concerning the commercial common sense here. I mean, um, there was two or three years worth of litigation in the case I dealt with, but the reality of it was when, when one reads the facts, you just come to the you know easy conclusion that the well the obvious answer was to you know pull the, cut the trees down to a reasonable height. Um, so I, I, I didn't go through this part because I didn't really have time, but the judge seemed to be flabbergasted by the, the fact that this couldn't have been agreed between the parties. And I think that is something one has to, of course, look at basic principles. But when you've gone back through those and gone through the checklist, then, of course, I think one probably goes to commercial common sense um, and has a look at it from that perspective. And I think um, doing those two very basic things, I think often will derive uh, the correct answer in, you know, all of our problems, really. Yeah, I think I think there's a danger of people thinking about the result in Arnold and Britain. And thinking, ah, oh, well, there's been, you know, there's been some absolutely massive change where commercial common sense can't, you know, be something that really moulds how these cases are decided. And it seems to me what Arnold was really dealing with was the quite difficult situation where it was a very clear agreement, but just had really unfortunate consequences. And what our cases and, and Fishburne was looking at was something that was generally somewhat vague. Um, I don't think it was incredibly vague. Use of development was probably an ill-advised word to use. But it wasn't quite in the same class, it seems to me, at least, as um, Arnold and Brown. Indeed. Well, I'm going to say thank you very much to all those who watched our webinar today. It's part of a series of webinars uh, from 39 and 6 Chambers, 39 from 39, on uh, real property, uh, planning, environmental, and all aspects of the built environment. Uh, and also, we also work in construction and across a number of different spheres as well. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and the slides will be available for distribution uh, in the next few days. If you have any questions arising from what we've spoken about, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us. But maybe it chimes or something that's on your desk or on your share file, maybe it doesn't. But always very happy <laughs> to talk about the issues raised uh, in the development of land. Thank you very much for uh, your attention and uh, look forward to speaking to you again in the next instalment. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody.